what we're going to look at is a conversation between uh, between Henry and uh, the artist Cleon Peterson dealing with strategies for difficult conversations and critique. Um, effectively, there, as I see it, there are two different methods to framework, to frame work in a critique. And uh, Henry's going to lay out uh, the approach that he took at this Cooper Union critique. And then he's going to ask uh, Cleon about uh, his insight. Now, Cleon is an absolute master of, of framing difficult work. So that I think there's some there's some things here. I think there are some things here that we can uh, that we can some insight that we can uh, glean and some different opinions that we can take a look at. The conversation was arranged very hastily uh, uh, on a very impromptu basis. I just said, hey, can I can I hit the record button for this? Because it might be interesting for the YouTube channel. So that's why Henry's not wearing a shirt. You know, it's not it's a very odd. It's a very odd look. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to to talk with me. Um, I had like a really interesting critique experience, uh, it, like a couple of days ago when I showed this 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 squash piece that I made. I went to the Met like a month ago, did this performance piece where I dressed up in these clothes, right? Wore this like weird. Uh, you know, glasses or these weird, this weird visor. I did some weird dance. And then I told, you know, I told people at the Met, like just random people, yo, can you take like a video of me? Um, and so, you know, I, I danced in front of them and, and, and like the neoclassical area of the Met and, you know, the aspect ratio 16 by nine to kind of uh, reflect that sort of the, like a TikTok sentiment. So I'm interested in TikTok. I like, I mean, I, I'm interested in like uh, its cultural implications, like what it's doing to, to us. Um, but yeah, I, I brought this piece in and um, the reaction was really interesting. I, uh, and I was wondering if you could help me out a little bit just in terms of strategy. Um, so I, I brought this piece in. I started talking about, you know, what I did. I went to the mat. I did this performance piece and I, um, they were, the, the reaction was pretty positive at first. And then I started talking about like the kind of the conceptual or like what I'm interested in conceptually. We can take an analytical knife and cut critique process into two different methods, really. One is called cold read and the other is where the, uh, the artist defends the work or the designer defends the work. So cold read is when you put work into a critique room and the people that are there that didn't make the work start talking about the work uh, the other way, which is not really called, there, there's no real names for these. It's not really called a defense, but the other is where the artist or the designer serves as a guide for the work. And what really what they're doing is that there's a kind of, there's all this language, all these words that they say that are supposed to correlate to the work. So what Henry is outlining here is that effectively he, he framed the work. He told the, the, the people that were the class uh, what his conceptual motivation for the work is. And it, the, the mood in the room really changed um, to something a little, a uh, little unhappier. Um, it was, I started talking about like, you know, that I'm interested in race. I'm interested in like the problematic nature of the Met. I'm interested in um, foregrounding these really incendiary issues, these really, uh, like, you know, issues of, of whiteness and, um, and, you know, problematizing and foregrounding these, these, uh, these issues. And then the, you know, the class kind of like went really quiet and the reaction I thought was pretty, was, was I, like, I started sweating. The reaction was kind of negative. Yeah, the reaction was really, I don't think was very good. So the strategy that he's talking about is doing something like this, right? What you, what you would do is uh, you, would, you would make a piece, you would disassociate uh, yourself from the piece and you would take comprehensive notes trying to play the chess game out in your own mind, trying to play the chess game in, uh, of critique out in your own mind, trying to anticipate in a way what the, what the, what uh, a non-informed viewer would would say how they would call the work into crisis and then what you do is you actually you hang a lantern on it you foreground that apparently that's what he did 
And so I was wondering if there's any way you could, you could talk, I think like maybe your work and, and mine does something similar. I, I think, think your strategy is different. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your strategy or the way you frame your, your the way you frame your work. Like the quote unquote smartest kid in the class, like takes a deep breath and he goes, I'm really glad that you um, started the critique with this because I was going to get there um, eventually. Just, I just like, I think it's, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you, we're going to, we're going to start with the most like polarizing, um, the most look, radical read of the piece. Right. And then, so he goes, he like sits there for a minute and he like takes a deep breath and he goes, how do I phrase this in the, in the nicest way possible? And he says, and like, and he, like he like thinks for a minute and he goes, you're completely tone deaf. And, um, I was like, Oh geez. Okay. Uh, he started talking about how this, the piece, um, uh, yeah, that he, he's confused why like he doesn't see any satire in the work. You're not making fun of anything. Or I'm not, he said that he didn't, there's, he didn't see that I was making fun of anything. Um, like you, I wasn't like throwing tomatoes. They even said like, why aren't you throwing tomato sauce or like, like steak or like gluing yourself to the work? They were really confused. Even the professor was like really confused on this. Like we need another piece for you to decide your political agenda. And then they, then they started asking me direct questions. Like, so there, one of the girls turned to me and she goes, why are you making this? I'm like, like I just circled back. I'm like to foreground these issues, right? And she goes, but why? Like, why are you interested in foregrounding these issues? And I'm like, like, I, like, do I go back in a circle? What's the deal? I was like, um, because I'm interested in, in the, uh, like, I was interested in the aesthetic of the Met. Like, I'm interested in neoclassical work. And then the idea kind of came naturally from that. And they're like, well, it seems like kind of a secondhand thought then. You need to, you need to spend a little time and think. And then they're like, you are participating in the very system that's oppressing, like, that's oppressing, or that's the oppressor, right? Like, this, they're like, this work seems very, really, really tone deaf. And you, yeah, that's, that's really it. Um, so one of the biggest challenges, I think, in, in my experience in art and design school is, is the idea of the critical voice of judgment. What he's articulating here is the fact that critique, in a lot of ways, places the artist in a defensive posture. You can see that clearly in the dynamic that, that plays itself out. And again, Cooper Union is an absolutely excellent school with incredibly smart uh, people that are there, both the, the professors or artists that are the professors as well as the students. This is extremely high level critique, if you ask me, particularly for an undergraduate program. But you can see that what it's doing is it's establishing a defensive dynamic. I, I, I believe that, you, that there's a paradox. What you have to do is you have to be able to think exactly what the students are saying. You have to be able to think about what the ramifications, think very deeply about what the ramifications of your work are without having that erode your capacity to make work. You know, so in other words, what you end up, what you end up seeing is you end up seeing, you end up seeing artists, artists and designers who, who end up being unable to make work because they constantly hear, they can hear the critical voice of judgment in, in their head about the logic of their work. And it's, again, it's a paradoxical situation, which is that you do have to think about the ramifications of your work. You do have to understand these things, but you can't get into a, uh, into a situation where it hamstrings the actual, the actual kinesthetic process of making. What, what is it about the neoclassical stuff that's like, uh, the, why did you foreground yourself in front of the neoclassical stuff exactly? Because it's rooted in like Eurocentric and phallocentric ideas, I think. And then also I just like the aesthetic. Like I like, those are masterful work. I, I'm interested in the sweat equity and like how uh, in, in, those, in those like older works, that, like the, the artist spent time and, uh, and it looks like the artist spent time on that. And that's like, uh, that's like honorific work. And then like at the MoMA or whatever, there'll be like a banana tape to the wall. And that's like, I'm not with that. And that's what a lot of the students are doing. And that's why they're kind of having an allergic reaction to my work in a weird way, I think. Because I'm spending time on it. Well, I mean, I mean, one of the things I learned at Cranbrook. 
Uh, I'll rewind, I, not to interrupt, but um, <clears throat> I think what I, th I think one of the issues that I see happening here is uh, the the um, in some ways the the effect of of conceptualism, and you know we can go back to Marcel Duchamp and ready mades. Now, needless to say, conceptual art, needless to say, conceptual art and conceptualism is an extremely valuable component of of contemporary art making. Cleon's work is is highly conceptual. I think I think I think the stuff that Henry is doing is uh, is also rooted in ideas. But you know, the, the, if we look at Duchampian ready mades as an example, there's a decoupling there. There is a disconnection of of uh, labor and the facility of the artist, the, the the mastery, the formal mastery of the artist from the idea itself. So in art schools. Uh, and in contemporary art in general, what you find is you will in fact find a, a tremendous amount of um, a tremendous amount of that kind of uh, conceptual work that is decoupled from labor. So I'm going to rewind to not cut off Cleon here. Is about framing like your work, you know, and like whenever you frame your work, like in a kind of like way where you're posing the question to people, like you're almost like inviting them to to a specific criticism. Because you walked in there and you kind of like told everybody how they're supposed to approach the work. Yeah. And then there, you also framed it with satire, kind of. And I think like the whole world is critiquing based on like instrumentalization right now. Yeah, so uh, Cleon here is talking, when he, when he says instrumentalization, I think what he's talking about is the idea that uh, in instrumentalist work, in the philosophy of instrumentalism, art is seen as a tool, it's a social tool. So there's clear criteria for social, what, blah, 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 what does this mean? It means that when he's saying that people are, are, are uh, critiquing work based upon instrumentalization, he's saying that most people want an extremely clear, in 2023, 24, what they're demanding is an extremely clear political agenda in the work, and I think that what he's pointing out is that in in Henry's in the in the work that Henry is is uh, is making the the Henry is problematizing. It seems like that 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 piece is in fact problematizing the condition and not making the political agenda of the work absolutely clear. I think in this conversation, Cleon goes on to suggest that at least for him. That's not the most powerful way of making work, but let's listen. Like, which is what you just walked into. So you kind of were like, yo, here's something to like talk about. And then I am the issue. Mm -hmm. Like, um, it's an unwinning position. I don't think you can win in that position because like, because you just set the parameters like that, like, okay, cancel me or something. <laughs> don't frame it. This is exactly, this is this advice that, that Cleon is about to give that you see on the screen here. This is, I think, uh, important advice. Because you're also creating a lazy observer where they don't have to actually do the work or put themselves out there, put themselves in crisis to, in order to like actually read the work itself. Okay. The, uh, there's like, and in that, they're just, you're just gonna have like a bunch of fingers pointing at you. Like, coming up with ideas like you're wrong there's no like actual like um see the art thing i think for me is like that <laughs> what you need to do is like make it so that people have access to look at themselves somehow and to be self-critical self-referential mm. if they're just looking at you and like you know destroying you and you've given them that job i mean like you know yeah okay Okay. Do you understand? Yeah, I get that. Maybe. Am I right? Or <laughs> because it, it opens up dialogue. Mm -hmm. But like, and and the one of the bigger parts, I think, like, say, like, if you're trying to do work where people actually like change their position or learn or understand or like deep dive or something, like, you can't uh, put a trap out there for them to go into. You know, in a sense, like, it's got to be some kind of give and take on both sides. You know. Like, uh, does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah. Like, you don't want to contain this. Like, you almost want it to, like, be free to kind of, like, roam. Like, yeah. Yeah, a lot of them, they said that, or the majority of the class said that they wouldn't have gotten 
there, they wouldn't have gotten to the race part. They were they were sticking with like TikTok fashion and TikTok and like that a read like that. And but then the the super smart kid in the class said he would have gotten to the. He said, "Oh, I know, I would have gotten to the race thing. Like that, that's what I was most interested in." So, but I think like like. Uh... I mean, I think that's like an interesting part of culture because like almost every criticism now is framed in that identity politics stuff because um, I think it's like a shortcut in a way like where people like have stopped actually kind of like having their own voices, you know, and are just joined on with like groups now. Uh, so like I think like everybody's kind of be looking at things through that lens right now, you know. Okay. I was wondering about the neoclassical stuff, and I think you, I mean, like, the way I think of neoclassicism is, like, the way that, like, um, groups used it as propaganda. That's, that's like, the evilness that I see in it, like, after, you know, like, in German, in Nazi Germany and, and ideals and stuff like that, you know? That's how I see it as the darkest, one of the darker movements, you know? Okay. Yeah, so I think in this conversation there are a couple of uh, there are really a couple of interesting points. You know, one is the is is obviously the 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 paradox of framing to framework or not to framework. Now, in art school in general, there are times when you absolutely do not have an oper- you, you don't have a choice. Some some art schools are 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 structured in a way where critique is literally a defense. So it is what uh, what Henry found himself in. Now at Cooper Union, you have the choice. He didn't have to do that. Cleon, one of the most important things that if you look at Cleon's work, one of the things that he does is he lets the viewer, he clearly lets the viewer explore, conceptually explore his work and to formulate their own, the viewer's own opinion about what what is happening within that work and that's the advice that he was giving. You know, I think that, as I mentioned earlier in this video, I think one of the problems with art school in general is that there's a paradox, which is that um, the students as well as the professors in good programs are encouraging you. They're encouraging you to think very deeply about, to think very deeply about what it is that you're, that you're working on, right? Um, but in a way, that kind of logical system where you, where you can hear the critical voice of judgment of of uh, your, your professor or your fellow students, that can hamstring a lot of people. So that's the first thing. The other thing is that, and I, I talked about the idea that there would be, um, that this would be strategies for difficult conversations in critique. And so what I would suggest is, I would suggest that, uh, that there is a method if you find yourself in a defensive crit, and this is the critique, and, this, uh, and I don't mean like that you find yourself defen- uh, defensive or flop sweating. What I mean is that if your critique is, uh, is established, is set up as a defense of the work, um, what, I, what I believe the most effective way of dealing with this is, is, to, um, is to come up with, to, to disassociate yourself from your work, to create, a, to create a, a bullet pointed set of potential criticisms that you're going to face. So if it's this piece or the piece isn't back. What would what would a un, uninitiated viewer? What's the hardest hitting thing that they could say about it? But then to remember the simple acronym, the simple acronym of ABC, and what is that? That's acknowledge, bridge, communicate. So what 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 you should do in in uh, in those flops flop sweat situations is to acknowledge the hard hitting nature of the questions asked to you about the work. Say. Yeah, I, I, I see the point that you're getting at. Reflect back the language that the, uh, that the person is, uh, is stating to you. Then what you do is you bridge to uh, the issues that you're secure in in the work. And you say, however, I think that the real issue at play is the following. Uh, and then you communicate the issues that you think are germane to your work. Now, that is a strategy. So this, this video, of course, is called Strategies for Difficult Conversations in Critique, right? That's a strategy. That is, not the, that is not the way that you learn, you know? The way that you learn is that you, you pay close attention to the criticism that is levied against your work. And you, you, you take it on genuinely, and you try to separate the wheat from the chaff. You think about what people are saying about your work. The biggest, 
The biggest challenge and the most important component, I believe, is that when you go back to the studio to try to make the work, when you actually go back to the studio to try to make the work, that what you do is you forget about all of that. You forget about all of that, you make your work, and you try to use intuition and you try to use the sum total of your experience to make powerful work. I will see you in the next video.